Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you not from here, welcome to the beautiful island of St. Martin. Um, this is uh, my second year in a row doing a presentation for the Caribbean Meetup, Aviation Meetup. Um, last year was in Dominica. I'm happy to see, very happy to see that the crowd already has more than doubled in size based on last year's attendance, and I hope this is a trend that continues forward. Today I'm going to attempt to do two things. Explain to you the hub function of our airport and also how air traffic control or air traffic services ties in to this hub function of our airport. And you will get some facts, um, also a couple figures that relates to our airport and hopefully I entertain you. Uh, my name is Duncan Van Heiningen. I've been in the aviation business for a total of 24 years right now. Started off at the airport as a flight information officer, became an air traffic controller back in 97, became a radar certified controller in 2004, air traffic service supervisor 2011, and I currently serve as the manager of training and development for the air traffic service department, meaning we are responsible for the new breed of air traffic control in St. Martin. And that's enough about me. So any company in the world, um, any successful company in the world has a mission statement and at times also a vision statement. In this case, let me put this down a little bit. Our mission statement is to be the regional leader in providing safe, secure, quality, and profitable airport services that contribute to the general economic and tourism development of St. Martin, Saint Martin, and the surrounding islands. With the vision that PJIAE, also known as SXM Airport, a regional leader in the provision of airport services offering a world of experience to all the stakeholders and customers. which brings us to the SXM airport being a hub and a hub partner with their airports within our region. As you all know, our geographic location is excellent, right on the corner of the Caribbean island belt, giving us access to virtually every single Caribbean island within the space of an hour and a half. So we are ideal airline hub for nearby Caribbean island destinations as a sheltered seaport also by way of our lagoon for boats as is evident if you took a drive on the causeway bridge you would have seen a lot of boats that are docked in the, in the lagoon. Um, those are visitors that come here by ocean and uh, we also of course have a lot of visitors by air. So these visitors come from North, South, Central America, Caribbean as well as Europe. And St. Martin Airport is recognized as the international airport for the Caribbean sub-region comprising of St. Martin, St. Martin, and our seven country hub partners, which can be seen right there. We have Sabre, we have St. Eustatius, St. Bart's, Nevis, Anguilla, Tortola, Dominica, and of course, French and Dutch St. Martin that are all partners. The Air Service Development Committee the ASDC was formed with the objective to develop service to the benefit of the partner countries. While we are different, our needs and objectives are much alike. The ASDC is comprised of the nine destinations depicted on the slide, and in its approach, this has led to the improvement or improved international regional air access including JetBlue service starting in 2008 and Copa Airlines in 2010. Through the ASDS, uh, ASDC found formation, we are giving emphasis to St. Martin Airport's hub functionality, focusing on connecting our country partners to enhance international airlines market presence and reach in the ASDC part of the Caribbean region, highlighting the importance of connecting and intermodal transport, recognizing the role of Winair, LIAT, also third-tier carriers, as well as ferry operators 
in providing access to and from the Caribbean country partner. And we're working towards offering more convenient portal-to-portal -portal times and ease of service access to guests and visitors. Portal-to-portal, -portal, of course, is making the time that you spend in between travel as brief as possible for your connections. As a connecting hub airport, St. Martin Airport has a competitive advantage over other Caribbean island hub airports, for instance, Antigua and Barbados, as it is closer to islands such as Anguilla, St. Bart, Saba, and St. Eustatius. I will go a little bit further into that also in the ATS portion of this presentation. And as you can see depicted right here, the four partners that are closest to St. Martin are Anguilla, St. Bart, Saba, and St. Eustatius where we have scheduled ferry service to and from Saba, along with scheduled air service, also the same for Anguilla, and the same for St. Bart's. The only one that does not have a scheduled ferry service is St. Eustatius. We have three structural layers when it comes to the ASDC. SXM Airport is at the core. Then we have all of our core country partners that use SXM Airport as their international hub, their gateway to the rest of the world. And then we also have country partners with their own international airports that use us basically as a supplementary service to what they're offering already. It's our beautiful airport. Which brings me to tying in the air traffic services. Now, obviously, providing that we have six airports in total that fall within our airspace, which I'll also go more in depth, um, this ties us, the air traffic service department, directly into us functioning as a hub, as a hub for the region. As you all know, without ATC, planes do not get to and from airports safely. So that's that ties us into this whole hub function as an uh, airport. So the Princess Julian International Airport is known worldwide for its famous landings and sandblasts of departing traffic at a threshold of runway 10, located at the crowded Maho Beach. People from across the globe visit St. Martin yearly to experience the movement of air traffic at our airport. Plane spotting and the jet blast surfing has become the number one cruise passenger tour activity on the island. I'm sure that um, the tourism director can verify that. Um, if not, by visual reference, you can always see that the fence at the Maho Beach is usually black. In other words, you can't see through it. St. Martin Airport has been featured on the Discovery Channel and History Channel, place, placing in the top 10 of the world's most extreme airports and most dangerous landings. And our neighboring island, St. Bart's, also features in the top 10 of this series. Juliana Air Traffic Services has a, has a staff of professionals, 32 professionals in total, with 24 of us being certified air traffic controllers. And we are in possession of procedural airdrome, which is also known as tower and approach ratings with approximately half also holding a surveillance which we utilize doing radar rating. Other staff includes our director, manager, administrator, and flight information officers. During peak periods, it, we are split into procedural and surveillance approach where one unit would be working on the approach floor, the next one would be working in the tower, and jointly basically get all aircraft in and out of St. Martin and our neighboring islands that fall within our airspace. Our airspace, for those of you who do not know yet that the airspace. Juliana's control, terminal control area is a pentagon-shaped area with an average lateral limit of 30 nautical miles and a horizontal limit of flight level 150 or 15,000 feet. Our TMA falls within San Juan's FIR, that's Flight Information Region, which is controlled by San Juan CRAP. For those of you that don't know when St. Martin Airport closes, our entire airspace reverts to the control of San Juan Center. Our TMA is split into class Gulf airspace, mean sea level to 2,600 feet, 
Class Delta airspace, 2,600 feet to flight level 150. We have Class Charlie airspace, which is directly around our airport, which is from surface to flight level 55, and it's centered at our aerodrome reference point with a radial of 10 nautical miles tangent with Anguilla's um, CTR, which is also defined by a 10-mile radius. As you know, Anguilla is only 12 miles away from us. We also are adjoined by St. Kitts and Antigua airspaces. We are not adjoined by Trinidad airspace because they have airspace above 245 and we are only up to flight level 150. Grand Cars and Simbart have temporary reserve airspaces that form what is known as the corridor. The corridor is located east of the island and it caters to traffic flying between and transitioning to the two airports, um, Grand Cars and St. Bart's. This traffic does not talk to Juliana Air Traffic Services. In other words, we have zero communication with this traffic. They are on either St. Bart's frequency or Grand Cars frequency or both at the same time. And a lot of French is being spoken in the corridor. As mentioned earlier, ATS provides three different services, namely tower procedural, we do approach procedural, and also approach surveillance using radar. There are lots of different ways of doing surveillance now. Radar was one of the first. Um, there's multilateration, we have ADSB coming in, and more technology is uh, coming forth as we speak, actually. But besides providing tower and approach services from St. Martin Airport, we also provide approach for the island of Anguilla, Grand Cars Airport, St. Bart's Airport, Sabre Airport, and St. Eustatius, besides our own. So that's six airports in total that our ATS unit has control over. Here we have some nice aerial shots from the different airports, we have L'Esperance Airport at Grand Cars. We have Grand Cars, Gustave III, very interesting landing. I've only done it twice and I'm in the field for 24 years. Very interesting. <laughs> and I don't go by ferry. That's not interesting. We have Wanchoira Skin Airport at Sabre, FD Roosevelt Airport, in Stasia and uh, Sabre, I believe, actually just recently won an award for the most scenic landing. And here we have Clayton Lloyd Airport in Anguilla, which I believe has, since this picture, expanded their ramp space and also built some new facilities, if I'm not mistaken. As you can imagine, Controlling air traffic for six airports within a TMA of limited proportions can be quite challenging. The two of the busiest airport within our TMA besides our airport are Anguilla and St. Bart's. It must be noted that St. Bart's Gustav III Airport is accommodating this volume of traffic providing only flight information service, which means they do not have actual certified air traffic controllers doing these duties. And St. Bart's has been known to handle volumes of up to 30,000 movements a year, which is a lot for a lot of Caribbean islands. The two airports also account for 25 to 30% of our overall movements that we handle as Juliana ATS. Having to handle traffic for six airports is compounded during the high season, in particular during peak periods where we record a landing or takeoff at Juliana every two minutes. The increase in high-end travelers by way of corporate jet, along with the movements mentioned above, also adds to the complexity of an already busy airspace. St. Martin Airport is number two in the, in the Caribbean in corporate jet traffic movements, only behind the gentleman that spoke behind, before me the Bahamas. I have some interesting facts and figures. Juliana Air Traffic Services handles an average of 90,000 movements a year, with our peak movements reaching in the year 2007, just prior to the international 
crash where we handled 110,000 movements. 65 to 70 percent of all the traffic we handle lands at Juliana Airport. The remaining traffic either lands or takes off from the other five airports within our TMA or our overflights transitioning our airspace. We have a total of four jet bridges, five hard stands, and 11 published parking positions for light or medium aircraft. We have general aviation parking at the hotel ramp, at the golf ramp, also at the west ramp, and the east side of the main, ra main ramp. I have an interesting picture. I'm not, I don't remember if I added it to this. but Combined with our cruise arrivals, St. Martin averages more than 3 million visitors a year, but like the gentleman before me said, that doesn't mean anything. Head count doesn't count. That's something new I learned today, and I'm going to take that to the bank. According to Simon's Central Bureau of Statistics, Simon Airport and its users account for roughly 60% of St. Martin's gross domestic product, which is pretty impressive for one port to do. As I mentioned, this year I embarked on a new position of manager of ATS training and development. And this came about because Juliana decided to stop trying to outsource all of our training and to start doing a lot more in-house training in the field of air traffic services. Um, whereas we always have to send people abroad, whether it's the Trinidad, Canada, or Curacao, that's where most of our basic training occurred. We've also done radar training in Miami, and we've had instructors fly in from abroad to teach us. So we decided to in essence, take our training in our own hand, and as such, started the wheel in motion of having our own training academy eventually with our own facilities in St. Martin, where we have locals teaching locals in the aviation field. So we started our basic ATC course last year in May, and I have my students in the, in the crowd right here sitting down to the back. We're almost done with a basic course. We're in the simulator portion right now. And um, I know for them it has been an interesting ride for sure. They came in knowing absolutely zero about anything aviation. And I'm sure by now you guys can have a conversation with them and they can actually have a conversation with you. So what we did, we purchased our ATC simulator. So it's a tower simulator that is located in our ATC facility on the ground floor. It has a capability to teach students both tower and approach using rate, well, basically radar. Um, there's a ground position, there are pseudo pilot positions on it. And in essence, this is our main tool right now to build controllers, because don't, you don't become a controller, you, we build you. We also received this year, 2017, we received our approved training organization certification from the Civil Department of Civil Aviation in St. Martin, which is our major step moving forward to actually realizing our training center. Approved training organization certification basically means that you are authorized to not only give courses, but to certify people. These are certified courses that are recognized by ICAO internationally. Which brings me to ICAO Trainer Plus. I know that a lot of reporters here in the, in, in the aviation field are very familiar with ICAO Trainer Plus. Trainer Plus program came about as a means to standardize training throughout the aviation field. And when you obtain a Trainer Plus accreditation, you are automatically basically in a database of schools that can provide ICAO recognized and standardized courses. So in other words, it will put St. Martin on an equal playing field with any ICAO Trainer Plus school or facility throughout the world, meaning 
if someone from Russia decides they want to they want to train in the Caribbean, they can choose St. Martin as a destination to train. We can cater to any international clients, um, any training that we that we are authorized to, to give. We will be able to give and certify people with ICAO certification. So that is the next step, and this is something that um, was tasked to me and we hope to accomplish by the third or fourth quarter of 2018 to have a certified training academy, whether we have the building or not, that we will be certified uh, ICAO Trainer Plus. Training in aviation, for those of you that have paid for any training, is very expensive. Having our training done in-house not only reduces travel fees, it reduces per diems, it reduces everything else associated with training abroad. So in, a, in other words, our company is probably set to save a couple million in, a, in the next couple years once we continue with our training program the way we envision to do, it, to do so. So with that, I would like to conclude and I will take any questions if you, got, if you guys have. So thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Mr. Bryson. Mic check. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Good afternoon. Great presentation. Um, I just have to correct you, though. It's the second most popular. The number one is actually drinking rum. Which you know. That's <laughs> yeah, the number one yeah, activity right. for, that's, among tourists. That's, that's number one in the entire Caribbean. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a question. It's something that um, in tourism we, 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 we have seen, and you've highlighted a little bit about the private jets uh, um, that we have coming to the island. And uh, my question is basically two parts. How often do we reach a cap? That we're a situation where literally we can not handle any more people at a given moment. They have to go send them to Antigua or Anguilla or whatever else. <laughs> and of course, I know it's a bit of a controversial topic because, it, you know, when, when that happens, somebody's upset. And they start to email the tourism department, they start to email the handler. And sometimes they say, yeah, ATC is not letting me in. So I think this is a good opportunity for you mm -hmm. to now explain what really goes down. And of course, I'm sure safety is a major factor. But Definitely. what really causes the situation where we literally have to say, sorry, you cannot land? We have a relatively small airport, although it looks big to most of us. When it comes to parking aircraft, we, ha we are very limited. Therefore, planning, proper planning for this high season traffic is basically you have to do it. If you do not do it and have all parties involved, do that planning, so which I'm talking about the FBO operators, I'm talking about the airlines, everyone, representatives from everyone, air, airport operations, um, the ATC, everyone has to be involved to plan ahead. When we do that, and which we have taken a step now to actually have an air, airspace and runway capacity study done, um, which is being finalized, I believe it should be ready in about a month, um, the final findings, because we already had an uh, intermediate finding um, meeting regarding that. And we will figure out what the airspace and, air and runway capacities are. And based on those figures now, we can start spacing traffic. Because the problem is not us being able to handle the traffic. The problem is everyone wants to come in at the same time between the hours of 10 and 5. That's impossible. So while we can cram 300 movements into a day, these same 300 people want to come between 10 and 5, and that's not possible. So therefore, planes end up getting turned away. And they get turned away because they do not accept the other slot, the other times that are, that are offered. So if I, if I can offer you 7 p.m. with zero to no delay, um, versus you coming in at three and having to hold for two hours, which would you prefer? But for the person that commutes to St. Bart's, lands in St. Martin, which, and goes to St. Bart's, which I would say 90% of private jets that land here do that, 
They want to come in before the sun sets because they have zero intentions on overnighting in St. Martin. They want to be able to jump on their yacht or jump on their, their commuter airline and head over to St. Bart's. So that is, yeah. <laughs> That's another logistical problem because at the end of the day, there's no parking. So you, he can land, we can close the runway, stop all traffic altogether. You know, and that's something that we definitely don't want to do. So um, we are actively looking for solutions, I can tell you that much, um, based on the study that is being conducted right now and the outcome of that. We will be in touch with our airport partners and come to a, the best solution possible, especially going into this high season coming up. So that's, that's the, the whole concept behind of that. Can you elaborate a little bit? Oh no, that's, that's um, the, 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 that's the flights between St. Bart's and Grand Cars. They don't talk to us because we, had a, uh, we made a special restricted area for them called the corridor where they go, they, have, they go back and forth and they don't need to call us. So they have procedures set in place for them to be safely apart. And um, it, well, it actually lessened our workload, which is awesome. Pre-clearance, pre U.S. pre-clearance. Pre-clearance, I know that they're in the works. Um, besides that, I can't really reveal too much, but I know it's in the works. With respect to the version of the conference that was held in Dominica last year, do you recall that at some point we had some discussion in terms of where the legitimate hubs in the region are? Right. And I'm just interested to know if, um, well, for want of a better term, does Juliana and NBA feel threatened by the existence of the other hubs, and why or why not? I think our position, our geographic position within itself, is a threat to anyone else in the region that operates as a hub. We have easier access to anywhere. Um, we have daily flights to Europe, daily flights to the entire East Coast. Uh, we have flights to Central America. We have flights to, to Curacao, which you can go further down into uh, Latin America. Um, you can reach virtually anywhere in the Caribbean, including Cuba from St. Martin. So, um, threatened? I don't think so. but. I mean, there's other markets that are competing. They are improving. They are expanding. Um, St. Kitts opened the FBO, I believe, two years ago. So they, they are prepared to, for increase in private jet air, uh, movements as well. Um, every airport that wants to make or do more business is going to, they have to invest. If you don't invest, you can't compete. And I believe we're in a good strategic position as Juliana Airport to compete with anyone in our direct region. Question yes. over here. Yep. Not a Go question, ahead. more, Sorry. yes, a question. Um, very impressive that you're given training here on the island. Is that going to be open to other islands nearby that wants to do the training, but instead of going to Miami and other places, they come mm -hmm. here? That is our intention, and that was one of the main reasons also behind us securing the ATO rating or the or ATO certification from the Civil Aviation Authority. Because without it, your, your training is not recognized, and you, you're not able to certify um, your students. Um, being that the Martin Civil Aviation deals directly with ICAO, and they, they are recognized by ICAO as an authority, they are the ones that are able to certify people. And now we, through that CAA, are able to also do the same. The airport did uh, 1.8 million passengers in 2016. I believe the harbor, I'm not too sure about the figures, maybe someone can help me, 1.7. So we're talking about 3.5 million tourists that touched the shores of St. Martin last year, uh, which is pretty impressive, I must say. Um, of those 1.8 million, I believe 12.6% are actually transit passengers that are not coming off of flights, they're just in transit. Um, they, they're not using our facility to, 
moving on to other destinations. You were saying that um, you were expecting to get, or you had got, uh, ICAO approval for the training facility. W would that mean that uh, the students trained by this academy uh, would be allowed to operate as air traffic controllers outside of the St. Martin Civil Aviation? Definitely. Um, as a matter of fact, if I decide to work at another facility elsewhere, um, as long as I do the unit training at that facility and the transitional training at that facility, I have to basically go through the procedure as a new trainee, but I, without the whole, excuse me, the whole length of training. So I go there, I do the unit training, I do transitional training, I work live traffic, and then I have to go through a certification process, and I will get a license from another unit. That's as is, because we, our license um, right now is under the Civil Aviation of St. Martin. Prior to that, we were under the Civil Aviation of Curacao, uh, which was also recognized by ICAO, because no air traffic controller can work without, uh, without being licensed. And that, that license is sanctioned by your civil aviation and recognized by ICAO. So, but it enhances, like, especially if we can get an ICAO Trainer Plus program going, it enhances everything because that program standardizes training procedures throughout the world. So, knowing that a person is coming from an ICAO, ICAO Trainer Plus facility, you automatically know the level of training that they received and the methods that were used to train that student. So that's the difference between having a regular school or academy versus having a trainer plus school or academy. Mr. Mikey from Down Street. Uh, thank you. Um, St. Martin is a tourist destination and um, tourists would like to feel safe and comfortable coming to us. I have a problem where people call our airport a dangerous airport. I've been flying in, in this airport, into this airport since 1973, and the airport is not dangerous at all. I it may be dangerous for the people <laughs> standing in line on the road, but St. Martin's Airport is not dangerous. And I think in one of your first mm -hmm. uh, slides, it showed the same thing. Yep. What, what, what happens is um, travelers, pilots, um, aviation enthusiasts on a whole, these are, this is how these programs come about. And they sit back, no, any, there's no bad, how you call it? No bad um, publicity. So I mean, in this case, we're on the, we're on the Discovery Channel, History Channel, most dangerous um, landings, but they're not dangerous. It's just over a beach. It's just over a beach. Um, I've seen, actually seen, we place, I believe, it's top three, and I've seen number sevens and eights that, to me, I would not fly into those airports. Right. No, we don't, we definitely don't have a, a dangerous airport, and contrary to that, contrary to that, um, there's, it's very exciting, but it's contrary to that because if we had a dangerous airport, we would not be able to secure more airlift. You know, we would not have the confidence of the, of the users of our airports, the airlines, the charters, you know, everyone that uses our, our facility. So, um, dangerous might be a wrong choice of words, but, I mean, we know, we know what we have, and, and, and it's, it has, so far, been a very safe operation. I'd like to ask how often you're re uh, reaching tarmac or parking capacity and where people are going um, if they can't get parking here. How many aircraft a year are you having to turn away? And someone suggested that the drop-off and park elsewhere, which I didn't gather that you actually answered. Yes, I, I, I actually did, because um, that question, that particular question, I'll do that one first, then go to the, the other one. If there's no parking, there's not no parking for someone to drop off passengers either. That, that's what it boils down to. You know, so if there's five chairs there, there's room for five chairs, you can't bring a next chair to put somebody to sit down and then move the chair. There's, there's no space. You know, <laughs> Bud just said, let him come in with parachutes. But <laughs> 
No, but what happens, what happens is, and especially when, um, sorry to say it, but really, really filthy rich people don't care about your rules or regulations. So they will try to push the issue and still try to get in. And this is where we sometimes end up with issues. Whereas a plane that did not get approval to come in tries to come in. And what usually happens in that case, they end up landing at their alternate airdrome. So they end up going either to Puerto Rico or Antigua or even St. Kitts to land. And then they would come in later to drop off their passengers when the coast is clear. You know, so that is, that is what happens. And, and in, in that field, in that field, in private, air, private airline flight, there's, there's a lot of um, people that just, they want to fly when they want to fly. They fly on their schedule, and that's the bottom line. So they very seldom have regard for what's going on at someone's airport. It's like, I just want to get there at 5 so I can jump on my yacht and get to St. Bart's. Who cares about ATC or who cares about ops? That's, yes. Yes. It's important to the destination again that um, how we handle that situation with being filled to capacity mm -hmm. is very important. That we do not come across as take it or leave it, but yep. explain. And this is this is something. And you see, um, there's a lot of conferences uh, in the U.S. There's a couple with with private operators, the NetJets, and all these different companies where it actually makes sense for representatives from our airport or from our country to go and have a chit chat and explain why and how. And especially with the, with the airspace capacity study that is being con concluded now, it becomes very easy. Because I can tell you off the bat, there's a system, you, you punch in the data, these, this, these periods here, nothing can come. Here we can take two, there we can take one, there we can take five, there we can take 100. And that's really what it looks like, because not, not everyone can come in between 10 and 5. It's, it's, it's not, just not possible. And we are magicians. Controllers are magicians, as they like to say. But um, there's only so much magic that we can perform. Uh, sorry to return to the parking issue, but uh, Graham worked at London City Airport and the apron space that he had was less than the size of this room, I would say, Graham. <laughs> and you managed uh, to make it work. And it's, it's not allowing five seats in the first place. You only allow four seats. So you and you have, to, you have to tell the, passenger, uh, the seat before uh, that he can't park there. Um, so you always have a drop-off area that uh, is and free. This is, this is the, I mean, that's where our main issue starts, that we never put that in place in the first place. So we just kept accepting. And people have gotten so used to us performing miracles at Juliana Airport that it has become the norm. So um, now when you tell people no, it's like, what do you mean no? You always accept us. But there has to be a point in time where we really say, listen, it's, uh, past this point is unsafe. We're not going to accept anymore. That's it. You know, and then they have to pick other times. Spend a night in St. Martin. Go in the casino, spend some money. You know. <laughs> that's, that's the idea. Be, because that's the reason we did the airspace capacity and runway capacity um, studies, so that we can basically put all of this in writing, have it published, have it published, disseminate it to all airlines, to all private operators that they know in advance don't even ask for a slot time at 3 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Yes.